I'm Dr. Hammett. I um, am a urologist. I specialize in female pelvic medicine and reconstructive surgery. Um, we just like to have a really long name. It used to just be female urology. A little bit about me. I grew up in Tennessee, um, went to medical school in Tennessee, and then I did my residency at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville with Matt Timberlake. Um, before uh, or after that, I went to the University of um, California, Irvine, and did a two-year fellowship in female pelvic reconstructive surgery. Um, after that, I went into private practice for a couple of years because I wasn't sure um, what I wanted to do. I enjoyed private practice. It was a really great experience, learned how to operate by myself and be efficient. But I actually really missed um, teaching and I missed residents and the team atmosphere and I missed doing some of the more complicated cases. So um, I had a, a friend that was a that was an attending at Emory and when she heard I was looking for a job and they were looking for a female urologist, um, the chairman reached out to me and I've been at Emory now for three years. I apologize for any background noise. My dog is active. Um, so a little bit about my specialty, female um, pelvic medicine reconstructive surgery, like I, I said, used to be called female urology. Um, and it is very, very similar to urogynecology or what used to be referred to as urogynecology. So you sort of had two different residencies. You could be an ob and go into urogynecology or you could be a urologist and go into female urology. But it turns out we pretty much do the exact same thing. Are we mainly specialize in reconstruction for prolapse, incontinence, fistulas, diverticulums of the um, of female genitalia or urinary tract? So um, I guess it was it's been a little while now, about maybe maybe close to ten years ago, eight to ten years ago. They decided to make it one fellowship instead of two, which is why the name changed to Female Pelvic Medicine and Reconstructive Surgery. So you can um, go into that specialty from either the ob side or the um, urology side. Um, similar to how you can do spine surgery um, fellowship if you're from neurosurgery or if you're from ortho. So it, it's similar to that. We get the same training. Um, I, I do vaginal hysterectomies. Um, my colleagues will do um, will do stent placements and ureteral um, some ureteral work as well from the ob gyn side. And in general, we are very collaborative um, specialty and work together quite a bit. Um, we also do quite a bit of, with colorectal. As you can imagine, when one thing goes wrong down in the pelvis, there's usually a lot of organs that are involved. Um, so we have a multidisciplinary conference that involves urogyn, female urology, colorectal surgery, physical therapy, um, that sort of thing to try to get the whole global picture in. But today we're going to talk about incontinence and um, the main types of incontinence for females. And this is something that is a quality of life issue. Incontinence is not fun and no one wants to change pads, but it's not going to hurt you. It's not going to kill you at any point in time. So the patient really has options of what they want to do. And so a lot of my job is just educating. Hold on just one second. <laughs> Sorry. My dog uh, has these toys that he just loves to chew on. Um, so a lot of my job is educating patients as to what their options are in treating their incontinence and helping them to best decide what treatment option is best for them, which sometimes is nothing. Sometimes the bother isn't that much, but they should at least know what options they have. I'm gonna to try to screen share. All right, can everybody see this? Yep, we can. Perfect, all right. Okay, so we're gonna talk about the different types of incontinence today. Uh, and then how to distinguish those types of incontinence, and then finally, what treatment options you have for each kind. So stress incontinence. Stress incontinence is the involuntary loss of urine related to an increase in your abdominal pressure. So you cough, sneeze, laugh, um, exercise, jump up and down, that's stress incontinence. It's a little hard when someone says, well, I leak when I stand up. 
That's a hard one to differentiate, but it might be actually be urge incontinence. They might be having a bladder contraction as they stand up, or it could be stress incontinence. So just that one symptom doesn't tell me as much as, oh, well, what about when you cough? Or what about when you really have to go to the bathroom? So urge incontinence is the involuntary loss of urine due to an irrepressible bladder contraction. You really got to go, you run into the bathroom, you don't make it in time, and you start to leak. This is usually um, part of the overactive bladder symptom complex. So overactive bladder is urinary urgency, frequency, feeling like you're not emptying all the way, having to go all the time, getting up a lot at night. But you can do all those things and not leak. So that you can have overactive bladder, we call it dry overactive bladder, or you can have wet overactive bladder, which is urgent on it where you leak. What's not as, as um, common, but does happen in women, is something called overflow incontinence. And that's essentially when you have a very full bladder and you're at max capacity and you just kind of leak out all the time. Just small amounts, but you never really empty all the way. It's not that common in women, um, but we do see it. So where do you start with a patient that has incontinence? They come into your office and they say, you know, and I get this a lot, you know, doc, I leak urine and I think I just need a bladder tack. But first, no idea what a bladder tack is. It's not actually a surgery. And people refer to about any vaginal surgery as a bladder tack. So I'm like, okay, that's great. Why don't we get to the bottom of what your symptoms are? So I, you know, find out how long have they been leaking for? When do they leak? Is it when they have the urge or when they cough, sneeze, laugh? And then it's a good idea to give an idea of the quantity. Are they going through one or two painting liners a day or are they going through eight depends a day? What about at night? How many times do they get up? Do they just get up once at night, which is pretty standard for anyone over the age of 55? Or do they get up you know, five or six times at night? Are they waking up and their entire bed is just saturated with urine? So you try to get into these things. And I usually also ask about recurrent urinary tract infections, um, needing to positionally void so I can only empty my bladder if I lean forward or if I lean to the side and that kind of thing. And the bladder is very important for this, but the bladder is in the pelvis and the rest of the organs in the pelvis also affect the bladder. So I ask about bowels, you know, are you constipated? Anyone who's constipated is gonna have worse overactive bladder symptoms. What about fecal incontinence? Do you leak stool all the time? Are you wearing the pens actually because you're leaking stool more so than urine? And that also can go around with um, how much damage was done during a vaginal delivery. They have a stage four, you know, laceration um, tore right through their sphincter and now they're incontinent of stool and bladder. And what about fecal urgency? Is that one of those things where when they have to have a bowel movement, they gotta be there in a second. And then you also want to ask them about their vaginal um, symptoms. Are they sexually active? The things that really question my family, I do a vaginal exam on every single woman who walks in my door for any sort of pelvic complaint. Um, and it gives me a really good idea before I do a vaginal exam. If the woman's 80 and she hasn't been sexually active in 70 years, or you know, 20 years, however long, um, and she isn't on any sort of vaginal estrogen cream, that's gonna be a difficult vaginal exam and I'm just sort of prepared for that. Whereas if I have a woman who's got a big bulge and she's had eight babies and she's still sexually active, then not as difficult, but it kind of prepares you for what you're gonna see or, you know, and have they had radiation, anything like that, that's gonna change it. So I also see how many times they've been pregnant, how many times they've um, given birth, and then ask how did they give birth? Was it vaginal or was it C-section? Just the act of being pregnant and carrying a baby on your pelvic floor can really affect your pelvic floor. So you can have stress incontinence, you can have urge incontinence, you can have prolapse just from having um, being pregnant, even if you don't have a vaginal delivery. Vaginal delivery does increase your risk of those things more so, but just being pregnant will do it. Um, have they had previous pelvic surgery? Does this patient have a uterus? Um, have they had a sling previously? And do they feel prolapse? Do they have like a bat vaginal bulge that they feel when they wipe? Um, that sort of thing. So that's, you really get a pretty good idea of what's going on with the patient just based on your HPI alone. But you need to take a really good HPI because patients often will associate things in the pelvis with each other. Like they'll tell me, you know, oh, I've got this vaginal bulge. I really want it fixed. And they'll tell me again, I want a bladder tack for that. And if I don't further question all of these things, because on anybody who comes in with a pelvic complaint, I do a vaginal exam and I ask them all three 
of these main um, areas. And the reason is that person complaining of, of a vaginal bulge, their main symptom of bother, bother may actually be that they have overactive bladder. But in their head, they've linked it. They think they have overactive bladder because they have prolapse. And don't get me wrong, prolapse is a risk factor for overactive bladder. But so is being a woman, getting older, having babies. So I could fix the prolapse and be like, I did such a great job. You no longer have any bulge. And they're like, yeah, but I'm still leaking. And that's what was really bothering me. So you have to get at what is actually bothering the patient. Is it that they have a bulge or is it they're leaking? Because otherwise that you get some unhappy patients when they come back from surgery. All right, so we also look at what pertinent history. Do they have diabetes? Diabetes is a risk factor for urgent incontinence. Um, Parkinson's disease, multiple sclerosis. All of these things, especially um, the neurogenic problems, can really affect the bladder. In fact, if you've got um, a neurogenic uh, diagnosis and you have overactive bladder, we often um, categorize you as a, as a neurogenic bladder because those bladders are pretty severely um, affected by their, by their neurosystem. Um, what sort of GI problems do they have? Uh, any infections? Have they been radiated at any point in time? <laughs> any medicines that they're on? Um, you know, narcotics and those sort of things will, will not only constipate you, but it'll make it harder for you to empty your bladder. Um, any sort of surgeries they've had in the past, brain surgery, incontinent surgery. So you just want to go over a pretty pertinent history to, to figure out if there's any um, extra factors. And then, of course, you want to do a physical exam. Like I said, I do a vaginal exam on almost every single woman who walks in the door. <clears throat> Importantly, here's a spot speculum. I use a lighted speculum. This is a POP-Q stick. This allows me to do a POP-Q, which is um, important for prolapse measurements. Um, some lubrication. I usually do a bladder scan, but if I need to, I can take a, um, a catheterized little sample to see how well the patient's emptying. Um, make sure that that the, if I'm concerned at all about the urethra, that it just goes through very easily. Now these smaller Q-tips, um, I think I have a slide on this in a second, you can do something called the Q-tip test. When it comes to a patient that um, complains about stress incontinence, that they leak when they cough, sneeze, laugh, before I do any sort of surgery, I absolutely have to prove that they have stress incontinence. So I do this with the, <laughs> with the exception of, I'm not standing, I'm actually sitting on the ground and my patient is, sta is standing up and I'm having them cough and sneeze or, well, not sneeze, but cough or bear down or sometimes I've had women I've had jump up and down. I have to see that they're leaking. There is another test I can get urodynamics, but one way or another, I need to prove that they truly have stress incontinence. Otherwise, I'm not gonna take them back to surgery to do a, to do a surgery if I'm not sure that they have it. So in my pelvic exam, I look at the urethra. I look to see if it's hypermobile, and you do this with the Q-tip um, test. I, I do that cough stress test and make sure they leak. I want to check and make sure they don't have any sort of diverticulum or anything that could be retaining urine. I check a post void residual. I want to make sure that they're emptying as well as they think they are. A lot of people with overactive bladder will tell you, oh, I, I go all the time and I'm never empty. And so it sort of sounds like they've got overflow incontinence, right? Well, they don't. Their bladder's sending them bad messages. They've only got 20 or 30 mLs in their bladder and their bladder's like, oh, it's time to urinate again. We should go in. And then they'll tell you they have a really hard time emptying because 20 or 30 mLs is not enough to urinate. Your bladder should not tell you you need to go to the bathroom before you've got maybe three to 400 mLs in there. And so if it's telling you that you've got to go and that it's full, even though it's not, your bladder really can't squeeze out, you know, 30 to 80 mLs. Um, and so the patient feels like they're always full, but they're not. So that's where the post void residual is really important. I also look at their vagina. Do they have atrophy? Um, any prolapse, any bulge, because prolapse is a risk factor for, for overactive bladder. Any tenderness, is there a mesh erosion from a previous surgery, and of course, a fistula. Um, fistulas, of course, can cause incontinence because you just continue to leak from your bladder. Um, but generally, when someone shows up in my clinic for a fistula, they're aware they have a fistula. They either got one from radiation or they got it from um, childbirth. So it's not that common that I diagnose a fistula, although it certainly has happened, I have. So this is the hypermobility, the Q-tip test. 
So what this does is it um, basically assesses the degree of rotation of the urethra. So you stick a lubricated Q-tip in the urethra, and this is not a real comfortable exam, so I, I don't do it often. Usually I just watch the urethra move and I can tell if it's hypermobile or not. <laughs> but you place the, um, the Q-tip in the urethra and then you have in Valsalva, and if the Q-tip moves more than 30 degrees, then you have significant urethral hypermobility. So this is what I mean. You place the Q-tip in, you have the patient buried down. If the Q-tip moves up more than 30 degrees, you're hypermobile. So what, why does this matter? Well, when it comes to stress incontinence, you have um, two main reasons for it. One is a, a urethral hypermobility. So if you imagine you have a hose and you put that hose on the ground and you step on it, there's really nice support under there. But if you put a hose in sand and you step on it, the water's gonna keep going because there's no support. So that's a hypermobile urethra. It's lost the support underneath the urethra to help um, keep the urine in. Other things that we're going to do to evaluate for incontinence, we're gonna do a urinalysis, um, a post-void residual. Avoiding diarrhea can be very, very helpful. If you are drinking five liters of fluid a day with a whole bunch of coffee and caffeine and soda, there's not gonna be a lot I can do to stop you from voiding every hour. That is normal. Your body needs to put it back out. Um, so sometimes people don't, you know, they've been told drink a lot of water their entire lives. And so they drink way more water than they need to be drinking. Urodynamics can be helpful, but I really encourage my residents to only get urodynamics when you're specifically answering a question or it's going to change your management. Most of the time, you've got enough information simply off of your um, good history and physical, your good history, or your, um, your <laughs> HPI, your good intake of surgical and past medical history, and your good exam, that you won't need urodynamics. But when you do, when you have a question and you're not sure, does this patient really have stress incontinence? Does this patient, you know, um, is the bladder, you know, relaxing like it's supposed to? then your dynamics can be helpful. Uh, other things that aren't very commonly used, I, I don't do cystos on everybody who has incontinence. It's not gonna change my management. It's not gonna really tell me any good information. That's different though if I see a mesh erosion or I'm concerned about a mesh erosion, I do look in. Urine culture, only if the urinalysis points me to, um, to, to looking for an infection. Um, other imaging studies really pretty uncommon for me to do unless I'm looking at something else. So this is your dynamics. Um, this is the test. The patient is in this chair and their legs are up in lithotomy position. They have a catheter in their bladder and a catheter in their rectum. So this, it's not a painful test, but it is awkward for the patient. Um, basically, the bladder is filled by one of the catheters and they're taking measurements to see that the bladder is increasing in volume but staying low in pressure, which means they have good compliance. They're looking to see if the bladder is squeezing all the time when the patient hasn't given it permission to. That can be a sign of detrusor overactivity, which does not have to be seen on urodynamics for urge incontinence to, to exist. This is not a perfect test. This is not even, it's not really even reproducing what physiologically happens. No one fills their bladder as quickly as we do with urodynamics. And in order for us to, you know, get more of a physiologic filling rate, we would be the, in there all day trying to fill these patients. So we do it very quickly, and the bladder doesn't always like that. Um, so then we, you know, have them cough, have them laugh. Did they leak when that happened? At what volumes did they leak? So it can give you more information. Um, but again, you only want to do it if you're looking for specific information. And then at the end, you have the patient void, so you'll see a nice bladder contraction, and they should empty fairly. Um, but as you can imagine, and I have a whole um, separate lecture just on reading urodynamics and how to how to um, do them. So let's let's get down to how treatment and um, management of stress urinary incontinence. So that's your involuntary loss of urine due to increased abdominal pressure. The risk factors for developing this are having babies, um, having a surgery in the area being postmenopausal, advancing age. There are various neurologic conditions that can increase your risk. Um, those aren't as very, that, those aren't common. Trauma, that's not a very common reason. Obesity though is a big reason. 
you leak because of increased abdominal pressure. Well, if you have a lot of weight on your abdomen, it's going to increase your abdominal pressure. There's not going to be a lot left. And women do not have an infinite leak point pressure. So even, even a woman who's never given birth, who's perfectly healthy and young, if you increase their abdominal pressure enough, they will leak. Just about any female will tell you if they are full enough and something happens, they very well could leak, even without any other risk factor, completely normal urethra. So if you have a woman with really that's really overweight, it, it's not going to take that much for her to just leak out. But there's not a lot I can do about that when you're that heavy. So the treatment there is just you, you have to lose weight. In fact, with a BMI over 40, I won't even um, offer a sling. They have to have a BMI under 40 for me to be um, willing to do that for, for multiple reasons. But one, because it won't work. <clears throat> so I told you there's two main types of stress urinary incontinence. There's the urethral hypermobility where you've lost that support and there's no backstop. And then there's also intrinsic sphincter deficiency. So most women actually have a combination of both of these things with urethral hypermobility being the, mm, the largest portion. But sometimes you'll do an exam and a patient will have a lot of stress incontinence and their urethra is like fixed. It won't move at all. And that they've got intrinsic sphincter deficiency. So basically the urethra is just staying too open. Um, and you'll see that in people who had slings in the past and who have started leaking again. All right, so this is just your urethral hypermobility. Like I said, this is, drawing isn't perfect because this ligament needs to go all the way around the urethra. It acts almost like a hammock um, underneath the urethra to give it support. It's not just that it's attached to like the anterior wall or anything like that. But basically these ligaments um, are broken and it's not able to support it anymore. And this is intrinsic sphincter deficiency. Basically the sphincter in here, it just leaves it too open. So what are your treatment options? Um, Kegels, Kegels, um, very well known. The problem is that most women think they're doing Kegels when they tighten their entire pelvic floor. And that's not how you do a Kegel. In fact, I encourage women not to do that as it can cause some pelvic pain um, in the long term. If you want to do a Kegel, I really, really encourage my patients to go to pelvic floor physical therapy. So they're special physical therapists who are trained to teach this. Um, and they basically teach the very specific muscles that you need to contract. And it's very effective, but it's like any other surgery or any other exercise, you have to do it every single day for it to be effective. Um, but if the patient's willing to put in the time and the effort, this can make a huge difference. Pelvic floor um, PT and then biofeedback. So sometimes they teach you how to do this by using biofeedback, which is um, really helpful. A pessary, that's another non-surgical. Basically, a pessary can be placed in the vagina and put extra pressure on the urethra to give it that backstop. Pessaries are nice because they're not surgical. Um, you don't lose anything by trying them. However, they have to be in exactly the right spot to work, and they usually don't work all that great. So they're ideal for a patient. I had a patient that only leaked when she salsa danced. We fit her for pessary, she put it in when she salsa danced, she took it out when she didn't, and she was very happy. But generally my patients who are leaking on and off through the day, depending on what they're doing, pessaries aren't the best um, treatment option. That being said, if they wanna try one, I've got no problem with it, it's very low risk. Um, for surgeries, there are two main surgeries that we do right now. We'll do a sling, which is placing basically the hammock back underneath the urethra. So you place a um, material underneath the urethra so that when you laugh, cough, sneeze, it's compressed against it. <clears throat> I can um, make that out of the patient's own tissue. So it can be a fascial sling. I usually take it either from the abdomen or from the leg. Or I can do a mesh sling, um, which has uh, got its own set of problems. They're both equally effective. And I usually um, go through a long spiel on my patients, um, giving them the treatment options of whether they want a mesh sling or a fascial sling, and they can choose either one, doesn't matter to me. <clears throat> with the mesh sling, well, I guess I should start with the pubovaginal sling, the fascial sling. So we were doing these, you know, back in the 90s all the time, but you have to harvest the fascia from the patient, which is painful, they have to stay overnight, and they, were, they have a lot of voiding dysfunction afterwards, a lot of urgency, frequency, got to go run in the bathroom, getting up at night to pee, having trouble emptying their bladder. Um, 
that sort of thing. Also more hematomas, sort of more right after surgery complications. But once the patient got used to the new way they avoided, you might have to loosen the sling a little bit. Um, there are really no long-term risks with it. That's your own tissue. It's never going to erode or go somewhere it's not supposed to. Well, in the late 90s, they developed the mid-urethral sling. And this was really easy to place. You could do it instead of it taking you two hours, you could do it in about 20 minutes um, for someone that does quite a few of them. Um, there's really not any or very much wooding dysfunction. The risk of that was very low. The risk of urinary retention was very low. It was an outpatient procedure. The patient went home and had very little to no pain with it. The problem is that's a foreign body. And there's a risk about of anywhere, depending on the literature read, anywhere between three to 7% risk that sometime in your lifetime, that mesh is gonna go somewhere it's not supposed to be and give you a problem. Um, and I end up taking out quite a bit of mesh. Now, I am one of the main referral centers for all mesh-related complications in the Southeast, so there's a reason I take out a lot of mesh. Um, but statistically, most women do very well with it. But I, I give them their options. Um, there's also periurethral bulking. Um, there's synthetic bulking material, there's collagen bulking, but basically we inject a bulking material around the urethra to help close it a little bit better. So just a little bit more into each of those. So this is a pessary. The pessaries that work for incontinence will have some sort of knob on them, and that knob has to go right underneath the urethra, and that gives it that extra um, pressure. They do have, um, I think they're called Impressa tampons. They're tampons that are supposed to go right underneath the urethra to give it a little extra support, um, you can find them in the in the pharmacy. This is a little, this is a little, <laughs> not the best um, drawing, just because your urethra is not this long <laughs> in a woman. It's more like, you know, from here to here, and the pessary has to sit right here and put the pressure basically right here. So as you can imagine, it, it doesn't always stay where it's supposed to. So slings, that's where we're restoring that backing. Um, indications, you can use it for stress incontinence with urethral hypermobility or intrinsic sphincter dysfunction. Um, we can use fascia, I can use mesh. We don't use cadaveric fascia or any sort of allograft or porcine, dermis, anything like that. It doesn't work as well, it doesn't last as long after two years their incontinence is back. So we really just do um, autologous fascia or synthetic mesh. These are placed vaginally. They have a success rate of about 85%. That does decrease with time, um, but generally that's a dry rate. So, you know, it depends on how much it bothers the patient. With these studies, they'll be like, well, over, you know, five years, it's only a 60% success rate. But if the patient only, you know, leaks a little bit when they cough, sneeze, laugh, and they have a very full bladder, they may not be really bothered by that. Um, but 15% of the time, it doesn't work well or work as well as the patient would like. Um, <clears throat> the slings, again, with the overactive bladder urge incontinence, sometimes it gets better, sometimes it gets worse, sometimes it stays about the same. And there's no good way to predict that. Um, so, you know, when my patients that come in with urge incontinence and tell, they, tell me they want a sling, again, lots of education to explain to them that the sling, that's not, a sling does not treat urge incontinence, treat stress incontinence, and most women have both stress and urge, but if their stress isn't bothering them, the sling isn't necessarily a good treatment option for them. So this is how you place the sling. I actually did this this morning. Um, you make an incision right underneath the urethra. Um, you kind of use the Foley balloon to tell you where the mid urethra is. Um, this looks kind of like it's over to the side, but it's really supposed to be right underneath the urethra. And then you pass the trocar up behind the pubic bone on each side. So this trocar will go through this hole and go around this side. And um, you also have to do a cysto. So you have to go in and make sure that there's no blue trocar or mesh anywhere in the urinary tract, not in the um, bladder, not in the urethra. And then you pull these up and then this, this mesh sits right underneath the urethra and then you close the incision over it. So it looks like this when you're done. There are two different types of mid-urethral slings, the trans, um, trans obturator, which the mesh goes through the obturator canal, or the retropubic, which it goes behind the um, pubic bone. 
I usually do retropubic um, for various reasons once it was the way I was trained. And you can get some hip pain from the transoperator, so I tend not to do that one as much. Um, we also have some more studies coming out that show maybe long term that the trans, uh, the I'm sorry, the retropubic one, this one may have a little bit better long term outcome data, uh, but that hasn't been published yet. That's just sort of what I've been hearing. So periurethral uh, bulking agents. This is really the only indication for this is if you do have intrinsic tincture deficiency, you place this with a cystoscope, use injection needle. Um, it usually only lasts a couple of years. I usually tell people just to have, you know, maybe two to three, maybe four injections in their lifetime. There's only so much space down there. After a while, you can't um, do any more injections. It's about a 60% success rate. This is something that I do a lot more in my elderly patients. This is, there's really no pain to, um, very little to no pain with this. It's an outpatient procedure. They go home, they don't even feel like they had anything done. And sometimes it helps them with their incontinence. So it's very, it's pretty low risk. This is how it's done. You place the scope inside the urethra, needle goes through there, and you inject bulky material around. This is more of a real life where you see you want good coaptation of the urethra, so you want it to close better than this. And this is the what it looks like at the end. So that's sort of the st stress incontinence. We'll move on to the urge incontinence. That's where you gotta go, gotta go, run into the bathroom, not making it on time. It usually is accompanied with uh, urinary frequency, not always. It can coexist with stress incontinence, call it mixed incontinence, stress and urge. But I think as hopefully you're all very well aware by the end of this um, lecture, stress and urge incontinence are caused by different things. They're treated very differently. They're not the same. So don't, don't treat them the same. It kind of bothers me that there is an ICD-9 code for mixed incontinence. I'm like, yeah, but they're two different things. Stress incontinence, problem with the urethra. Urge incontinence, problem with the bladder. So what are your risk factors? Being female, getting older, having babies, being overweight, having previous pelvic surgery, diabetes, and prolapse. As you can imagine, this is exceptionally common. So what are your first line treatment options? The nice thing is the AUA really lays out very well um, your treatment options for urge into three lines of treatment. And the first line is behavioral. You want to limit fluid intake. You know, usually recommend 64 ounces of water a day, but I always tell my patients, especially my heart and um, renal patients, your bladder is not going to kill you. It's just annoying. So if your cardiologist tells you you need to drink three liters of water a day for your heart, drink three liters of water a day for your heart. Um, and we'll deal with the, with the bladder. But if they are able to, drinking no more than 64 ounces, which is about 1.5 liters, is, is better. Um, time voiding, it's not a good idea to train your bladder to go every 30 minutes. It's also not a great idea to train your bladder to go every eight hours. So really, I try to get my patients to go somewhere between every two to three hours. I tell them to avoid bladder irritants, caffeine and alcohol being the big ones, but there are others. Some people just can't tolerate it, any sort of carbonated water. Um, so if there's a bladder irritant for them, I usually tell them to, to avoid that. Um, no fluids three to four hours prior to sleep. I usually say don't drink anything after dinner. Um, I have so many patients that tell me, well, you know, I, I get up four or five times a night and after I, after I go, I drink some water. It's at my bedside because, you know, I, I, I'm, I need to make sure I'm hydrated. <laughs> and I'm like, your body will make sure you stay hydrated. Please don't drink anything after dinner. And it really helps. Um, you want to aggressively, and I do mean aggressively, treat constipation. If you have really large stool balls that bind your bladder, not allowing your bladder to expand, you're going to pee all the time. So if your bladder's not working well, your colon probably isn't working well either. If your colon's not working well, I guarantee your bladder's not working. In fact, aggressively treating constipation is the main treatment for pediatric uh, urology when it comes to overactive bladder. Their bladders are almost always overactive because they're constipated, and the same is true for adults. Um, you want to look at eliminating contributing medications where you can. So if they could come off the diuretics, that would be great. If they could not take their diuretics right before they go to sleep, also would be great. Um, lower extremity elevation. So, you know, I tell my patients that the first time that your legs and your heart are on the same, like, level is when you go to sleep, all of that fluid's going back into your system. And you're going to pee, pee it all out. So I try to get them to get their um, lower extremities up sometime in the um, mid-afternoon. Try to get all that fluid back in their system to pee it out before they go to bed. CPAP. So if your patient has sleep apnea, <clears throat> sleep apnea causes right heart strain, which causes you to release even more ANP. 
So it will cause you to go to, bed or to the bathroom even more than normal. So people who um, start using their CPAPs will comment that they don't get up as much to urinate. Uh, pelvic floor physical therapy is great because the physical therapist can take so much more time to work with the patient on these behavioral things. They also can work on something called the freeze and squeeze where you like stop everything you're doing when you get a bladder contraction, squeeze, this is the time you do squeeze your entire pelvic floor, you let the bladder contraction go away and then you calmly walk to the bathroom. That, just so you know, is how you retrain your bladder of say, you're putting the key in the door and you're unlocking the door and all of a sudden you start leaking. Um, you can sort of retrain your bladder by doing the freeze and squeeze. So physical therapy can help with this as well. Second line, and we often do start these with first line treatments, are all medications. So anticholinergic medications, I have them all listed here, there's a whole bunch of them. And then there's one beta um, agonist medication, uh, Mirabegron. So <clears throat> beta agonist basically they, they go to the beta receptors, they bind to them, and cause the, the bladder to react, where anticholinergics are trying to block the cholinergic receptor so that the bladder won't squeeze. They're two different receptors, so there are occasions when I will use both an anticholinergic and a beta agonist. So they work on different receptors, and you can get added um, benefit if you use both. But usually before I do that, I'll have gone through all the second line, all the third line treatments or I'll have a patient that's just not well enough for all the third line treatments. Let's talk about anticholinergics. Um, we don't love them, and I really actually try not to have my patients on them, and here's why. They cause dry mouth, dry eye, and constipation. Constipation makes your overactive bladder symptoms worse. They also um, are, you know, have a really high discontinuation rate because of these side effects. Patients just don't stay on the medicine. Um, cognitive decline and increased risk of dementia. So there's been some really good studies out that have shown that just being on anticholinergics for not that long, three months, can slightly increase your risk of dementia. So it's better to have these patients not on anticholinergics, but it's an ongoing fight with the insurance companies to, kit, to cover Mirabetric uh, or to allow us to do the third line treatment options without having them on anticholinergics necessarily. If I'm gonna use an anticholinergic, I try to use the one called Trospium. It's a quaternary amine. It does not cross the blood-brain barrier. So that is the, um, the anticholinergic that I generally will choose first. Um, contraindications, impaired gastric emptying because it slows down all your bowels, uncontrolled narrow angle glaucoma, urinary retention, you wouldn't wanna use an anticholinergic in any case. Third line treatment, so there's three. Um, sacral neuromodulation, there's two companies that make it now, Interstim and Exonix, um, percutaneous tibial nerve stimulation, or Botox injection. So let's talk a little bit about each of those. Sacral neuromodulation, I describe it like a pacemaker to the bladder, but that's not really what it is. It's just easy for my patients to understand because Interstim also makes pacemakers and they look exactly like this, except you place them next to your heart. So while a pacemaker will actually pace your heart, an inner star and sacral neuromodulation doesn't really pace your bladder. It does in a sense, I guess. So what is the theory behind this? Well, when you're a baby, your bladder is not really a reservoir for urine so much as it's a conduit of urine to just shoot right through. So urine hits the bladder when you're a baby, your bladder squeezes and you empty. That's good for your kidneys and you're small, you can wear diapers, no problem. As you get older, you develop neural pathways and reflexes that allow you to be potty trained, which is one reason we tell people not to potty train too early, you have to develop these neural pathways. So once you develop neural pathways, you're potty trained, but as you get older, those neural pathways can, like any other neural pathway, degrade, um, or the nerves can become damaged from childbirth, surgery, a lot of different things. Um, and you can revert back to your urine hitting the bladder, bladder squeezing, bladder empties, because it does protect the, the kidneys um, that way. And so that's the default mechanism. But quality of life wise, socially, it's not great. You don't want to be in diapers when you're in your 70s. Um, so this is basically trying to reset those neural pathways, re-stimulate them, um, to go back to having the bladder as a reservoir and giving you more control. 
So basically, I place a wire next to the S3 nerve through the foramen. And this is an example we do it in the OR of um, us testing them to make sure they're in the right place. And once I'm in the right place, I place a wire right through next to S3. And then it's, it's attached to an external battery, and we stimulate it for two weeks. And if it helps the patient, they have 50% improvement and they're happy, we go back two weeks later and we implant the battery into the, kind of a, in the butt cheek. Um, if they are not happy with it, then we just pull the wire out. This is really about 70% effective when it comes to urge urinary incontinence, but it is over 90% effective for fecal incontinence. So again, important to talk to your patients. If they have that really bad fecal incontinence too, this could be a really good treatment option for them. It could help both. Percutaneous uh, tibial nerve stimulation. I love this treatment. <laughs> it is basically acupuncture, and it's like one of the only times I can tell you that there are no side effects. I apologize, my cat is now, my cat. Um, so there are no side effects with it. Uh, there might be a little skin irritation. That's about it. It significantly can help with nocturia. The big things are that it, it's time intensive. You could get a treatment which takes about 30 um, minutes once a week for 12 weeks. So the patient has to be willing and able to come to your office quite a bit. And then after that, you get monthly maintenance. It's not quite as effective. Usually patients are about 60% improved. Um, but it really helps my patients with really bad nocturia. They tend to sleep much, much better. I have so many patients that love this treatment because there are no side effects. It's not taking another medicine. They didn't have to have surgery. Um, but it tends to be my patients who live fairly close to our clinics. Uh, and who are older and retired. As you can imagine, somebody who works is gonna have a hard time coming once a week or even once a month. Botox. So Botox is essentially, as you all know, a paralytic. So we wanted to make the bladder stop squeezing all the time. We can paralyze portions of it. Um, however, there is a risk that it works too well and your bladder doesn't squeeze and you go into urinary retention. That's about a 5% risk. It is temporary, the Botox does wear off, but until it does, the patient has to be willing to catheterize themselves. Uh, remember I was talking earlier about neurogenic bladders, bladders that are affected um, by your neural pathways like MS, spinal cord injury. Botox is usually the mainstay of treatment for those patients for several reasons. A lot of times when they have an alternate way already of emptying their bladder, a lot of those patients are doing catheterizations or have an SP tube in. Um, also, because in order for PTNS or for sacral neuromodulation to work, you have to have an intact neurologic system. So that signal has to be able to go from your leg to your spinal cord to your brain, back down your spinal cord to your bladder. And if the signal can't make that, then it's not going to work. Now, that's not to say that, I mean, spinal cord injuries aren't always complete. Um, you could have lesions in your brain that don't disrupt that pathway. So it's not to say we won't try it. It's just that Botox generally is the mainstay of treatment, and that's why. So we're just gonna go a little bit over overflow incontinence. It's not as common. This is where your bladder is very, very full. There's lots of different reasons for it. You kind of have to figure it out. Medications, um, spinal cord injury. Generally, you can have like bladder shock right after a spinal cord injury, but that tends to resolve after about six months and you'll start peeing again, unless it's a sacral injury, and then you kind of end up with a flaccid bladder that never squeezes. Um, diabetes can do this, and neural, again, neural, um, very similar to neuropathy. Um, in females, outflow obstruction from either a cystocele, which is an anterior wall prolapse, a sling. Males, it tends to be the enlarged prostate. Sorry about that. Um, a urethral stricture, something like that can do it. It's kind of a vicious cycle of the muscle deteriorating while you're continually leaking. These can be difficult to treat. Um, but you kind of have to first decompress the bladder. You have to get them emptied through intermittent catheterizations or a suprapubic tube, something like that. And then you want to try to look into more of why they had this. Is it because they um, have a really big prostate? Do they need to be on an alpha blocker? Do they need to be on um, a 5-alpha reductase inhibitor? Do they need to have a TERP? If it's because they have a really bad prolapse, does that need to be fixed? Um, so the treatment options really just depend on what, what caused the overflow incontinence. But this is another reason we check a PVR and post residual 
because you'll have your patients tell you that I've, I'm never empty, I'm always full, and they've got, you know, 10 mLs in their bladder, and then you have patients that tell you that, or even better patients that tell you they empty just great, because they have absolutely no filling to their bladder anymore, and you, like, stick a catheter in there and get 800 mLs out, and you're like, you don't empty just great, I think I've discovered the problem. So, just in review, stress incontinence. Problem is that the urethra. Generally, your mainstay of treatment is surgery. Urge incontinence. Your problem is that your bladder medications are generally the primary treatment. Mixed incontinence, um, combination of urge and stress, that's your majority of your patients. So you do a lot of questioning, you know, which of these bothers you more? Is it equal? And then you've got to do education on which we treat first and why and what it's going to treat and not treat. Um, and then overflow incontinence in general, um, the problem in the female is the bladder is overactive and not squeezing enough, but it can be from outflow obstruction like a prolapse or a sling, why it's so important to do a vaginal exam. All right, let me get back to this, hopefully. Stop, share. Okay, I'm back. All right, so questions about any of that? And I'm, I'm done on time. Dr. Hammett, thank you so much for having us. Sure. Um, I have, it's sort of a, a broad question, but I've heard some of the residents talk about some like socio-demographic factors and like common features that they see in a lot of pelvic organ prolapse or incontinence patients. Is that something that you feel like rings true with your experience as well? Yeah, so I think that um, sort of a loaded question. Unfortunately, socioeconomically, we have patients that just don't seek care um, for monetary reasons because they don't have access to the care. And so you'll get those patients and they'll, you know, I, I have patients that come in because they, you know, once in a while will leak into a panty liner. And then I'll have those patients that finally are like, I can't deal with this anymore. This is too much and and they're going through eight depends a day and they're you know their bladders are clean and they haven't tried anything they haven't seen anybody and of course you you know can they afford the treatment what is what is the best for them what works for them and so you know you'll and you'll you'll see this that when you rotate at grady and for the rest of you grady is our like our um our community hospital that um sees the uninsured or the underinsured and um, when you see those patients, they're like, uh, I, I can remember seeing a penile um, cancer and it been obvious that it's been going on for a really long time. So you're going to see like more of the end stage of the disease because the patient unfortunately hasn't um, sunk, sink, seek, sunk, seek care. They didn't seek care for it until later for, you know, very valid reasons. Um, but it's one reason that education is so important is that you know they know what their options are and whether they take it or not is completely up to them and continence isn't going to hurt them physically but you know if you always smell of urine it's not going to help you for a job interview it can be really hard to be around your family or even wanting to be around your family so it can be very socially isolating at the same time so while physically it might not emotionally you know socially it can did that answer your question? I feel like I went all over the place. No, totally. It was a kind of a broad question, so that was perfect. Thank you.